Before we start the video, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you who tuned in to episode one of Sports Therapy. We actually just posted episode two at the same time that this video is going up, so be sure to check that out. Also, if you wanted to be part of that before 10,000 subs club, you better get on that now. Anyways, thanks again. As a Browns fan, I had to constantly hear the same joke over and over. Who would win between the Cleveland Browns and Alabama, a college team? This was mostly a jab at Cleveland Browns fans because of how bad the team has been, but some fans embraced it. To me, this is such a pointless concept. There is no way that a college team could ever win, and besides, this game would never happen, so it's a pointless thought experiment. But then I found out about this. The College All-Star Football Classic. A preseason football game between a team of college seniors versus the defending Super Bowl champions. This is Soldiers Field in Chicago. Those are the Dallas Cowboys, and it seems a bit unreal to see them here because they are here to play the College All-Stars in less than two hours, a game that you'll be watching on Channel 8. The Cowboys have been looking forward to this game. Coach Landry is quite serious about it. We have heard rumblings out in Thousand Oaks, California all week to the effect that he does not plan to play many rookies because he does not want his team to become the first professional team to lose since 1963. This is ridiculous. America's team playing against college kids. But that's not it. Teams like the undefeated 72 Dolphins, the ruthless Steel Curtain, and others played in this game. Just imagine being a college kid lining up against dudes like this. The game was played once a year, usually around August, and it went on for 42 years and played in front of crowds as big as 105,000. So let's go back and find out more about this football phenomenon. In the 1930s, Ark Ward, a sports editor of the Chicago Tribune, had a lot of influence in the sports world. In a time where the NFL was trying to gain more popularity, he started a charity event to help support that. This became known as the Chicago College All-Star Game, an annual preseason football game played at the Chicago Bears Soldier Field. The people of Chicago loved it. It spread like wildfire. In fact, in 1939, there were seven separate games being played between college all-stars and their local NFL teams. But because the Chicago one featured the defending NFL champions and usually the best college players, it's the only one that stuck. The charity event was a massive hit. The inaugural game in 1934 played in front of a crowd of nearly 80,000 fans. By 1942, the attendance numbers recorded reached over 100,000. It would maintain a minimum crowd size of 50,000 throughout each and every game that was played. Oh no, it happened. It actually happened. The Browns, who were NFL champions in 1954, played the college all-stars before the 1955 season and lost 30 to 27. Well, at least the Lions sucked too. They lost in 1958. Actually, this isn't as embarrassing as you might think. At that point, the series favored the NFL just about two out of every three games, winning 15 of the 25 matchups. I guess it makes sense why the game caught on. It was competitive. Even going back to the very first game between the Bears and the All-Stars. Talk about a barn burner. A 0-0 tie. Oh, it seems as if fumbles got in the way. Now, I know some of you are wondering how a group of college kids who had never played together could even compete, let alone win, against a defending NFL champion, a group of men that had been playing together for years. Here's the two big reasons as to why. Number one, the NFL was not a powerhouse like it is today. As Dean Heibel puts it from this article from sportsthenandnow.com, in the 1930s, the NFL was still a fledging league looking for a foothold in the sports world where baseball and boxing were the kings. In fact, professional football players were often seen as mercenaries while the college players were better known and more popular across the country. NFL players did not make a great living back then most of whom were working regular jobs in the offseason as opposed to training like they do nowadays. The second reason was by the 1940s, the college all-stars allowed black players to play for the team, where the NFL had not integrated quite yet. I couldn't believe this next part when I found it out, but the actual Jackie Robinson, one of the most famous athletes in American history, played in the 1941 charity game. 
One of the Bears' best players at the time said that Robinson was, quote, the fastest man I've ever seen in uniform. Anyways, as time went on, the level of NFL play improved. Black players were integrated more into the league, and the college All-Stars failed to win another game after 1963. The series would continue through the 1976 season, where it would have a very abrupt and rather ridiculous ending. In a matchup that featured college's best versus the mean and nasty Pittsburgh Steelers, the All-Stars were hopelessly outmatched. The starting college quarterback, who had just been drafted by the Steelers, got hurt. Then the backup would also exit the game with an injury. It was still the first half and the college team was down to their third string quarterback. Remember, this is a charity game that means nothing, but that was the least of the game's problems. Most of that 1976 game was played in a downpouring of rain. It was so bad that some parts of the field were under as much as a foot and a half of water. In the third quarter, with the Steelers up 24-0, the All-Stars coach called a timeout due to the high wind speed and lightning. Look at those conditions. It was flat out unplayable. After that timeout was called, drunken fans invaded the field, causing the game to lose all control. Fans were sliding around, numerous brawls broke out, and they ripped one of the goalposts out of the ground. NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle decided to call the game right then and there. Like I said, this was the final game of the series. The enthusiasm for the game had been slowly fading for years. In what started as a spectacle to the local fans who came to watch a good game, had evolved into an event for drunk college kids, with attendance numbers dwindling by the decade. If you think getting hurt in a meaningless bowl game in college nowadays is bad, in 1949, one player who was practicing for the college team tore up his knee so bad that he never played a snap in the pros. Overall, it was time to wrap it up. Although, I can't help but wonder how the game would be nowadays. If this game was played today, let's say all the players at the Combine this last year versus the Kansas City Chiefs, what do you think the score would be and how the game would go? Comment down below. Honestly, I think the game would be a hit. Imagine those college dudes trying to defend this. Let's Jumps in the air and completes it. Look out! Afterburner time! Hartman to the end zone for the touchdown. My goodness, sir, there's some things to look back on this one.